Hello and welcome to Roundtable. Has a health revolution arrived right in the middle of a pandemic? Could a medical discovery mean the end of malaria and other deadly infections? Remember the letters MRNA. They stand for messenger ribonucleic acid. And mRNA teaches our cells how to make a protein that triggers an immune response inside our bodies. Very good to have you along. I'm David Foster. The very first COVID vaccine made by Pfizer and BioNTech was mRNA. And now there are plans using the same technology to target malaria, which kills just under 3 million people a year. However, there are still obstacles to overcome. The COVID-19 mRNA vaccine developed by Pfizer, BioNTech and Moderna has been a major success for public health. BioNTech now wants to, as it puts it, help eradicate malaria by using the same breakthrough mRNA technology. The Germany-based group said it aimed to begin clinical malaria vaccine trials by the end of 2022. If successful, the shot could be a step forward in the fight against malaria, the flu, even cancer. According to the World Health Organization, there were 229 million cases of malaria worldwide in 2019, leading to the deaths of more than 400,000 people a year, mainly young children in Africa. Using technology such as this is a faster way of developing vaccines and could bring an end to the decades-long search for a reliable malaria shot. However, despite the benefits, there are still risks and unknowns. They are not as stable in high temperatures, making it difficult for distribution. While the mRNA vaccine brings great optimism for the future, is it a game changer for global health? Well, let us go first of all to Ottawa in Canada. And there we see Rewad Dionandan, epidemiologist at the University of Ottawa, who specializes in global health. Then to Maryland on the east coast of the US, and we see Prakash Srinivasa, assistant professor at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. And then we come back to the UK and welcome Jake Baum, professor of cell biology and infectious diseases at Imperial College London. Um, if I could come to you, Ray, what, first of all, you, you have a rather neat way of describing the way that uh, mRNA works. Yeah, so all vaccines work the same way. They essentially show your body the intruder, the virus you're trying to keep out. So your body gets to know who it is they're trying to keep out of their uh, out of the cell. So imagine there's a fugitive in your neighborhood and the police are trying to alert you to keep this fugitive out of your home. They can go door to door and show you a picture of the fugitive and that's fairly inefficient, but it can work. But imagine the cops can instead email you a picture of the fugitive, you print it out at home, put it on your own door. They say, oh, this guy, I'm keeping this guy out. That's how mRNA works. It's essentially telling your body to make the image, make the picture, make the thing that I can recognize to keep out of my home. Very effective. Now imagine you can do the same thing for any number of images, any number of fugitives. It's not specific to this one guy. It can be applied to a variety of contexts. Why is it so different to other vaccines? Traditional vaccines either present a live virus, which is not great because it can affect you, or a weakened virus, or sometimes a dead virus. mRNA is just a fragment of the virus, first of all, so it can't really infect you. And second of all, your body is making it, so you have better control over it. And also, it's better for immunocompromised people who might respond differently or poorly to a live virus being injected into them. Also, it's the vehicle that matters. So getting the, the mRNA package into your body is a kind of uh, universal packaging device that we can now fill that content with other kinds of mRNA for different kinds of, of diseases. Previously, any given vaccine had to be tailor-made for that disease. Now we have a catch-all pickup truck, a delivery system that we can now inject any number of genetic content instructions for. Wow. Uh Prakash, and this, this would be of particular noteworthiness when it comes to something like malaria, which is such a big killer and has been so hard to beat. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, malaria, people have been trying to develop a malaria vaccine for decades. Um, and in fact, there is indeed a, a vaccine that is currently under implementation 
um, uh, by the WHO in three African countries. Um, the challenge has been, um, uh, number one, um, that the, the targets have been um, uh, not uh, optimal, um, uh, to, to say the least, because the, the life cycle of the parasite is quite complex. Um, the parasite enters the red blood cells to cause disease, but it also has a silent stage that infects the liver as the infected mosquitoes uh, uh, transmit that stage of the parasite. And so the current vaccine targets the silent stage of the parasite. Um, and therefore, it's going to be critical um, uh, as to what kind of targets uh, that the BioNTech guys are proposing to, uh, to uh, utilize in their mRNA approach. But as my previous guest uh, um, uh, mentioned, the mRNA is quite powerful because now you can mix and match any number of candidates that you would like to test. Uh, so that's the power of the mRNA approach, I think. Is it possible that this could be the way to target any number of health problems? It certainly has uh, uh, the advantage, as, as, as we pointed out, that makes it an ideal candidate. Uh, but every challenge, every uh, instance, in this case malaria, has its own unique set of challenges. Um, uh, because, for instance, in the case of the COVID, uh, the proteins that are made by the virus are indeed uh, prepared in, inside the cell, are, are generated inside the host cell. So the cells, the, the, the human cells already know how to make the COVID protein. On the other hand, for the malaria parasite, the parasite makes the protein inside its own cell. And therefore, it's going to be a tricky process to have our human cell make that protein. And there's going to be a lot of optimization that probably is going to be required uh, to make it work. Uh, but it, it remains to be seen how effective it's going to be. Well, let's hear how enthusiastic the, uh, the head of the World Health Organization is. The very high efficacy of two mRNA vaccines for COVID-19 have shown the world just how powerful this technology could be against many diseases, including malaria. The pandemic has also demonstrated the urgent need to invest in scaling up local production capacity, especially in Africa. So, Jake, he mentions there Africa. Malaria is prevalent right the way across the continent. But malaria, you believe, is not quite as simple as some of the other things that mRNA um, could be used against, uh, as Prakash was suggesting. Absolutely. I mean, I think one of the things that we maybe take for granted is we got pretty lucky with COVID. Um, we're dealing with a very new virus, which has broken into human populations for the, for the first time. Not the first coronavirus, but this is, this is the first time this virus has been seen. Um, it's a very simple virus. I mean, it, it's, it's only got 13 or so open reading frames, which is like a gene, which might, some of which make proteins. For something like malaria, we're dealing with a, a parasite that has 5,000 genes. It has a lot of variation, and it's had millennia. I, I really like Ray's analogy with the, the fugitive. If you're a new fugitive, you might forget to take off your red raincoat. And then we launch a whole immune system attack against a red raincoat, and yes, we win. We get it. We get lucky. Malaria's had millennia to devise any number of different uh, uh, costumes or, or ways of disguising itself. And in fact, the challenge for us moving forward and for any pathogen, if we want to use this amazing technology, and it is amazing, um, is, to, is to develop something where the, the, the intelligence of what we put in and not just the, the, the vehicle itself. So I think it ain't just what you've got, but it's, how, it, it's what you put in it, which is what's really important. And I think that's where um, Prakash's point is so important that, that we, we, won't, we won't get as lucky with something like malaria or any new pathogen if we just simply put in the biggest, shiniest object into it and hope that the immune system then works against it. Are you a bit worried that people are getting carried away with this? Um, I think we should all get very energized and excited about the technology, but I think we shouldn't rush to just put in the most obvious thing into these technologies because I don't think society will allow us to fail with it. I think if we fail with vaccines, we lose our window of opportunity. There is a lot of enthusiasm right now, and so I think we have to be very careful what we put in. And in particular, I think you know, we, we, just to restate that, we, we mustn't just put in the first most obvious protein that everybody else has worked on and stick that in um, an mRNA vehicle and hope it works and then, you know, maybe suffer the consequences of it not working. Ray, what we will come to some of the difficulties that mRNA vaccines present in terms of cost and temperature storage, et cetera, et cetera. But something like this, it's, it's almost like a 3D printer in a way, isn't it? Because it could be turned around so very, very quickly. Yeah, in fact, the COVID uh, mRNA vaccines were produced in 48 hours. 
after the gene was first sequenced. Now that's the result of the result of having years of preparation for this. But as new variants arise, we could theoretically create uh, new multivalent vaccines to new versions of COVID again in 48 hours. So the turnaround is quite high. What we need, of course, is investment in the infrastructure and the human resources to allow that turnaround to happen at scale at a global level. That's coming. The challenges are mostly managerial uh, in addition to scientific. Are you talking about the fact that nobody at the moment seems in that much of a rush to waive patents? No, I'm not, actually. I'm talking more about the building of specific factories, the acquisition of raw materials, the training of human resources, because the same kinds of uh, tools um, are, that for previous vaccines aren't really relevant for the current ones. So a scale-up has to take place over the next few months with facilities built in key places like in Africa and in Asia so that distribution can be managed more effectively. And as you mentioned, storage is going to be an issue too because mRNA vaccines so far require a deeper cold storage. And so a larger infrastructural investments must be made to experience the full impact, the transformational impact of this technology. So that's yet to be seen. Would it be fair to say, and I, I suggested um, to Jake that perhaps people were getting a little bit carried away, um, would it be fair to say that this could be a game changer? In my opinion, it can be. It's too early to tell. But remember, we can look at this in two ways. One, mRNA can be used to create preventatives against infectious diseases like tuberculosis, influenza, dengue, chikungunya, COVID, possibly malaria, but also as, as a therapeutic to treat people with existing chronic diseases like cancers, cystic fibrosis, possibly even heart disease. If that's the case, well, we're looking at a brand new terrain. It's still too early, but the promise is intriguing. OK, Prakash, what are the, the difficulties? They've been slightly referenced so far on the programme, but specifically, what are the difficulties with this? Well, um, I, I would echo some of the points that Rewat and, and, and Jake mentioned. Um, I would add to it um, that one of the important challenges that we are facing, assuming that we do have a, a good candidate um, that shows good promise in, in human trials, getting it uh, accepted uh, by the, the people that are going to be needing to take this vaccine is an important factor. As we are seeing with the COVID vaccines, vaccine hesitancy is still a big problem. So that's something that we have to start working you know, right away, uh, not wait for the vaccine to come out and then try to convince people. So that's one thing. From the biology perspective, um, um, again, it's choosing the right vaccine candidate or in, in this instance, probably multiple candidates. And it's going to uh, involve the success in developing such a vaccine. Uh, it needs that the companies like these biotechs, large biotechs collaborate and make available the technology to the basic researchers you know, who are evaluating candidates and then the sharing of that information back to the companies. And, and sort of this two-way flow of information is going to be extremely important uh, for developing a successful vaccine. Um, and, 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 and as far as malaria goes, uh, it's also going to be extremely important to target multiple stages of the parasite. As I uh, alluded to this before, the parasite is a complex life cycle, and, and the form that causes disease is very different from the current vaccines that target the different stage of the parasite. So it's going to be extremely important that an eventual malaria vaccine incorporate components that target different stages of the parasite to make it more effective. Jake, without wanting to lose our viewers here, you talked about, I think, and I'll get the numbers here slightly wrong, 13 sequences uh, with COVID, 5,000 plus with, with malaria. What has to be done to overcome that? Well, um, I mean, I think uh, so much of vaccinology does rely on fundamental discovery research. We need to understand um, how you know, complex organisms like parasites, very, very different from a virus. Um, they're much more like one of our own cells. And, and, you know, if you think about all of the funding and resources that go into cancer um, each year, we need the same kind of level of resource investment in understanding a complex pathogen like a malaria parasite in order to understand what each of those components then does. And then we have to go through that systematically or using computational approaches to really understand what we might then put together into uh, what I like to call a mosaic structure, uh, which, which could then be the payload to go into a plug and play technology like um, an RNA vaccine. So I think- How far uh, away yeah, are those kind of breakthroughs? Every malaria researcher out there has got their favorite candidate or candidates they'd like to give it a go. And I think Prakash made a good point. I think a two-way dialogue with the technology experts and the, 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 the pharma that is developing the vaccine platforms 
should be working with researchers to try out everything. And I, I really do think we need to give it a, a fair go and not a one hit. And if we fail that well, there, then this technology is not right, for example, for malaria. And I, that would be a disaster. So hopefully uh, there'll be a lot of two-way traffic and, and we really can try a lot of different candidates. I've certainly got my own you know, preferred strategy, but, but I won't pitch that here. <laughs> but well, let's hear now from the people at BioNTech, the German company that helped develop the mRNA vaccine for BioNTech. Why now? Well, because the time is ripe, the response to the pandemic has shown that science and innovation can make a difference when stakeholders work together towards a common goal and with joint willpower. Rewa, the suggestion there, and it's already been alluded to on this program, is that we might not have got this far if it hadn't been for COVID, that while it's not a blessing in disguise, it has added some momentum to all of this. The pandemic has accelerated many things in society. By some estimates, we have moved technology ahead by six years in terms of things like this kind of virtual conversation. And the same applies for biotechnology. The mRNA uh, revolution was going to happen at some point, in my opinion, but it's been accelerated profoundly. Back uh, a year ago, I predicted that we wouldn't have vaccines for another four years. I was wrong because I didn't understand the power of mRNA and how close we were to certain breakthroughs like this. So without question, COVID has given us an opportunity to try out new approaches and technologies. And of course, the new financing model as well that allowed so many vaccines to come to market faster was instrumental in all this. So to me, one of the breakthroughs is in how we think about vaccinology and how we're willing to invest more and to tolerate failure in R&D to allow more products to come to market faster. If we continue on that way of thinking, I think we'll have a, a far more effective and impressive pantheon of tools at our disposal within a few months or years. You, you, you must be well aware by now that I'm not a medical man. I'm absolutely astounded by what you're telling me. But when it comes to cancer, and I asked you all to consider this one, I'll stick with you, Ray, what if I uh, can at the moment. When it comes to cancer, how would you vaccinate against a particular type of cancer, or, or would you have to wait until somebody had it and then allow this vaccination, however wonderful it may be, to do its work when there is already a problem with the body? Could you prevent it from actually happening in the first place? It's conceivable. Now, BioNTech right now is in phase two trials for a vaccine against skin cancer. It's unclear to me whether it's being trialed on people who already have the first signs of skin cancer, or people with the genetic predispositions to cancers. If it's the latter, those with the genetic predisposition, then you can you know, certainly target certain, some aspects of the physiology. But the more exciting part to me right now is the more likelihood of getting therapeutics for those who already have cancer. So imagine you have tumors that can be identified that are specific to your genetics, specific to your physiology. Now we can tailor make a, a, a targeted mRNA-based therapeutic to just go after those tumorific cells, those cancerous cells. So what we're looking at here is a potential revolution in personalized medicine, especially around chronic diseases like cancer. If, um, and Prakash, let me come to you just to share this around, if I may. If there are 20 different types of cancer, and I'm sure there are many more, we're talking about liver, lung, lymphomas, uh, leukemias, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, could you possibly at some point have one vaccination that targeted each one of those collectively because they have similarities? Well, I mean, that can be answered in two ways. One, uh, it depends on the antigens that, that are being shared between different cancers, right? So if there is unique um, epitopes uh, from proteins um, that are uh, uh, shared between multiple cancer subtypes, that is certainly conceivable. Um, and in fact, there are a number of, uh, the, the analogy I would use are, are certain cancer drugs that are repurposed for, you know, that are developed for one cancer, but then they are repurposed for others because they might be hitting the same target uh, um, or, or maybe even a second target, um, so to speak. So um, a lot of that, I would think, depends on, on, on what we uh, have learned uh, uh, based on the markers, the genetic markers uh, that identify the unique cancer subtypes. And then if there are shared features that can be um, targeted, uh, that's certainly a way, uh, uh, the way forward. I was wondering also about tuberculosis, um, which is a bigger killer, I think, than, than malaria. Um, again, you could eliminate a whole host of diseases this way. Could, could you not practice? Do you want to continue or should I throw that one to Jake? Well, yes, yeah, cer certainly. Uh, you know, uh, uh, it, it's an interesting um, aspect about the tuberculosis vaccines. And, and many of you might be familiar with the BCG vaccine. 
Um, and and th this was, in fact, uh, a, a vaccine that was given to me in my uh, uh, grow growing up in India. Um, it, it's the one earlier... that gives you the funny mark on your arm, isn't it? it <laughs> That's right. Sort of that imprint. is right. That yeah, is I've... right. Yes. Right. So, um, and then early in the COVID, during the first wave of COVID, uh, surprisingly, India did not have as many cases or at least as many severe, serious cases. And it was attributed to the cross-reactivity uh, uh, that is afforded by the BCG vaccine. It remains to be seen whether that's true or not. Uh, but certainly, I mean, the, the goal uh, of a tuberculosis vaccine um, uh, is certainly out there. And, and uh, hopefully with this mRNA approach, that's an achievable goal. Um, I'll, I'll be looking forward to research on, on, on those aspects as well. Do you think, Jake, and tell me if this is a silly question, but I don't mind being told it's a silly question as long as you've got an intelligent answer. Would it be possible at some stage um, to offer this as a prophylactic to unborn children? Wow. Um, <laughs> fascinating question. I mean, maybe I can sort of, sorry, I, this, I feel like a politician, I'm going to deflect your question and, and sort of maybe bring it back to, I guess, my own personal agenda, which is that this technology is amazing and, and, and uh, has incredible potential, but I think there's a real danger of it becoming a, a sort of a rich northern hemisphere, poor southern hemisphere divide with so much of the technology. I think many of the ideas and uses of it will, will have profound effects on health in rich nations. But actually, many of the diseases that, 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 that in the in developing world uh, that, that the children die from each year are preventable. Many are vaccinatable against. And I think if you know some of the most simple strategies towards vaccination will actually have the most profound effects on human health but not maybe for some of these complex ideas. So, I haven't... And that, that, is, that is if yeah. we allow for the manufacturing process to be made easier. I don't know how that's yeah. possible with something that has to be kept well below freezing. And also if we share the, the ideas and the, the intellectual property behind this, the, the patent waivers that I suggested, those would be the two most crucial things when it comes to allowing this to spread to the global south, if you like. I think that's true, but I think also there's a lot of uh, engineering going on at the moment to explore thermostability, so the ability of actually making these vaccines more stable. And, and so investment in that is bound to have huge payoff in terms of if we can make an RNA vaccine, which is actually room temperature stable, has a shelf life or a shelf life in a fridge of, of months rather than days or weeks. Um, I think actually, you know, and, and really to, to reiterate that point that we need localized manufacturing and distribution. You, you cannot rely on what we've got at the moment where, you know, European vaccine is trying to be distributed around the world. So I think if you can get localized manufacturing and we can uh, come up with formulations which are more stable, um, absolutely. I, I think actually the, the technology will get there and it will have impact. Does anybody want to answer the point that I, I put to Jake um, about the fact that this could perhaps prevent diseases <laughs> uh, from the moment of birth for the rest of your life? I, I would, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, um, I think it's important to make a distinction here between CRISPR and mRNA. I think there's a confusion here. CRISPR technology is literally gene therapy, rewriting your genetics to make you, you know, possibly immune to some genetic uh, predispositions. Um, mRNA vaccines are not that. mRNA vaccines contain genetic material that tells your body to make a certain protein to develop an immune response. So. There is a, a temptation uh, in the larger public right now to conflate those two and to uh, talk about mRNA vaccines as if they're gene therapy. They are not. So I don't think it's appropriate right now to think about uh, injecting unborn children with vaccines of this nature. That's not on the table as far as I know. Uh, it's more exciting now to think about how we can use the technology to address existing diseases that are profligate around the world, like influenza. We haven't talked about influenza yet. The influenza vaccine every year has a very poor match to the circulating strains because by the time we've identified the strains and made the vaccines, the strains have changed. So a good year has a 40% you know, uh, match to the circulating strains. Absolutely yeah. extraordinary. I'm, I'm going to go to Prakash. We've only got another three minutes. I could sit <laughs> oh, talking to you guys for about another two <laughs> hours if you'd be prepared to listen to me. But where would you put this if it is a medical breakthrough? Um, on the scale of things, with penicillin, with antibiotics, uh, with, with sterilization such as blisters, where would you put it? Wow, um, the ones that you've mentioned are, are you know, at the top. Um, the mRNA um, 
you know, uh, it's an advancement in vaccine technology. Uh, as Rewad initially mentioned, there, there have been quite a number of vaccine technologies that have been applied to existing vaccines. And this is an extension of that. Uh, where this has a, a heads up is, uh, uh, you know, where the speed of uh, production of these vaccines is just amazing. It's just fantastic uh, uh, that you can get an mRNA vaccine within 48 hours of identifying the target. Um, right. So, so that's where I, uh, it is. So we've had, uh, you know, in, in some ways you could call it the low hanging fruit that we've, we've been able to grab hold of that in terms of the COVID vaccine. But it remains to be seen how broadly applicable it is to complex diseases, infectious diseases, as well as uh, diseases like cancer. There uh, hasn't been a eureka moment yet, but it could come. Uh, it's 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 possible. I mean, it's it, this is the first uh, go around that we've had uh, uh, with the mRNA that's been at this success uh, at the world uh, uh, scale. And we'll have to see whether this can be uh, uh, extended to other complex diseases. If it can, um, then we'd certainly worth having that conversation. But at this point, um, I would be cautiously optimistic. It's been absolutely fascinating. Thank you very, very much indeed. Uh, from Canada, from the east coast of the United States, from the United Kingdom, I thank our guests for taking the time to be with us. I thank you wherever you happen to be watching this edition of Roundtable for your patience and your interest. From me, David Foster, from the Roundtable team, goodbye for now. We hope to see you next time. Until then, ta-da.